We've labeled this entire unit modernism, a term that now seems a little strange since modernist art really comes to the to an end in the mid to late 20th century. I'm not going to linger on this slide. I'm really just including it for review purposes, but you do need to know that the early 20th century was a time of great political, intellectual, and artistic upheaval. World War I revealed the savage underbelly of technology and dashed hopes that the human race was progressing steadily toward greater peace and prosperity. Nietzsche proclaimed that God was dead. Marx proclaimed that capitalism was ripe for destruction. Freud proclaimed that our dreams revealed our true inner selves, and it was all about sex. In the world of art, we will continue to encounter a bewildering march of isms, many of which are listed on this slide. For now, just realize that art in general moves away from illusionism to abstraction as artists seek to use color, line, and shape and composition to convey a deeper reality. You'll notice that once again, I'm borrowing and inserting summary slides. I think you'll find them useful as you try to review all these isms. What we're really looking at, starting with the screen, which you just saw, and the paintings I'm about to show you, are the different branches of Expressionism. Impressionists tried to capture a fleeting visual reality. Expressionists, really starting with the post-Impressionists, whom I would argue are a subset of Expressionism, really tried to capture emotional reality. The primary tools they used were brilliant, even jarring colors, thick textured paint, and strong lines, including black outlines, although note again that Cezanne sometimes used less textured paint. Fauvism was a brief but influential movement of French artists who rejected fin de siècle despair and symbolist literary pretensions. They wanted to return to Impressionism's joyful embrace of nature while retaining post-Impressionism's expressive rather than realistic use of color. So here is a painting actually entitled The Joy of Life by the founder and leader of the Fauves, Henri Matisse. The painting is filled with references to past masterpieces. Can you identify any of these? Well, we see shout outs to the pastoral scenes of Venetians like Titian, Angres's sensuous long-backed nudes, Monet's luncheon on the grass, maybe even cave paintings. Like Cezanne, Matisse employs shifting perspectives. He uses landscape more as a stage than as a realistic setting, with trees featuring essentially as curtains. The painting is imbued with sensuality, and that's heightened by the bold, pure colors. Picasso, by the way, was very jealous of this painting. It was after he saw it that he began working on Demoiselle d'Avignon, basically Picasso's exercise in one-upmanship, which we'll soon see. Here again, we see color liberated from descriptive reality. Not even Parisian women sport green noses. Again, like Cezanne, Matisse uses color patches, advancing warm colors and receding cool colors to create a perception of death, depth while still embracing the essentially two-dimensional quality of painting. Here are two more characteristic Matisse paintings, in case you get an attribution question. Note the expressive use of bold color and what his critics called an unfinished look. Line has likewise returned in the form of boldly outlined figures. And now that I've introduced Matisse, way too quickly, let's hear from a student presenter. Just a few additional points. You learned from your reading why Matisse was so fascinated with goldfish. Remember that, hint, hint. Matisse was also fascinated with patterns, especially textile patterns. You saw this in our required work. Here are a couple more examples. The odalisque on the left was painted after Matisse traveled to North Africa. Andre Durain was a co-founding Fauve artist and a McConnell favorite who didn't make the cut, but you might be asked to attribute a painting to the Fauves based on its highly saturated, expressive colors and joyful spirit. Duran was also important to the history of art because he collected African art, and he introduced his collection of fang masks to Matisse and, even more significantly, to Picasso. The dance reveals the influence of Duran's African art collection, and the wildly vibrant colors are again typical of the Fauves. Another prominent Fauve painter who does not show up in your textbook is Georges Rouault. He was a devout Catholic who painted many religious scenes. So I hope you enjoyed that brief glimpse of the cheerful wild beasts, because now we move east and the outlook, political, philosophical, and artistic, becomes grimmer. 
By the beginning of the 20th century, the old authorities of king and church were under challenge from science and from democratic politics. In Germany, however, the Kaiser's autocratic regime held on to power. Late and rapid industrialization caused great social dislocation, and a string of German philosophers pronounced that God was dead, that history had come to an end, and that the established order was crumbling. German artists were especially influenced by Nietzsche, who declared God was dead and called for a deconstruction of morals, for moving beyond good and evil. Here's a passage from Nietzsche's Thus Spake Spak Zarathustra that gave de Bruque the bridge its name. Man is a rope stretched between the animal and the superman, a rope over an abyss. A dangerous crossing, a dangerous wayfaring, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous trembling and halting. So here's a famous painting by our required artist, although it's not our required work. Again, see the jarring, dissonant colors? I'm reminded a little of Mannerist artists who also sought to unsettle their viewers with strange combinations of tertiary colors. You can also see that Kirchner was influenced by Munch. He is introduced, interested in psychological angst, in the individual's alienation from society, and in the dangerous, unsettling power of women. The German Expressionists were more likely than the Fauves to paint urban scenes, and the frenetic but isolated life of city dwellers is a constant theme in their work. They deeply admired Van Gogh and often imitated his swirling brushstrokes. They also employed angular lines, again reflecting what they saw as the sharpness and danger of urban life. Here are a few other paintings by Kirchner that capture some of these same elements. Aggressive, jarring color and the objectification of women, to use a feminist term. On to our student presenter. De Blau Reiter was formed in 1911 in Munich as a loose association of painters led by Russian immigrant Vasily Kandinsky and German native Franz Marc. They shared an interest in abstract forms and the colors of the rainbow, so-called prismatic colors. They felt that these colors had spiritual values that could counteract the corruption and materialism of their age. This is really a much more hopeful group than the one we just saw. Kandinsky wrote 20 years later that the name Blue Rider emerged from from Mark's enthusiasm for horses and his own love of riders combined with a shared love of the color blue. For Kandinsky, blue is the color of spirituality. The darker the blue, the more it awakens the human desire for the eternal. The horse was also a prominent subject in Mark's work, which centered on animals as symbols of rebirth. Kandinsky is very important to art history because he's really the first modern artist to move entirely into the world of the abstract. Let's hear from a student presenter about this rather startling work. You may have heard this already, but Kandinsky was especially influenced by what he saw as the perfect abstract art, music. Kandinsky sought to create image-free art that spoke directly to the senses, the way music did. In fact, most of his works bear titles such as composition or improvisation. While Kandinsky's paintings lack clear representational figures, they all seem to capture a kind of cosmic conflict. Kandinsky was fascinated, for example, by the story of the flood in Genesis and by the apocalypse described in the book of Revelation. He also formed a close friendship with Arnold Schoenberg, a musician who was trying to work outside the traditional musical scale. He developed his own 12-tone scale and composed all his works using this scale. I found a YouTube video that juxtaposes Kandinsky's paintings with Schoenberg's music. Here's a brief clip if you enjoy it, and I confess I'm a little too traditional to be a Schoenberg fan. Feel free to watch the entire video, which is again wonderfully weird. Kandinsky's paintings are very distinctive, which I'm guessing makes them tempting choices for an attribution question. So Franz Marcus was another member of the Blue Rider School, as I've mentioned, and in fact is most famous for his paintings of blue horses. He's another painter who's dropped off the list, but I'm showing him anyway because I love his art. The pure colors notwithstanding, this is a violent painting. In 1913, war was threatening and it would break out in just a year. These animals seem to be trapped in the face of coming catastrophe, soon to be shattered by man's inhumanity. And indeed, Mark died in the war, ending his brilliant career much too soon. 
So here are some of Mark's beautiful blue horses. We had a large print of this work hanging in our family room when I was a child, and I wanted to walk into this painting. I still do. Here are more Mark animal pictures. I haven't talked about cubism next, that's next, but the way that Mark breaks animals into different surface planes shows the strong influence of Picasso and Brock. The brilliant colors, however, are pure blue rider. And with that, we'll move to cubism and perhaps the greatest giant of the 20th century, Pablo Picasso.